Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about anthropogenic climate change. Yeah, first non-interview of 2020 and we're doing this. So let's jump right in. First, a disclaimer. The sole point of this video will be to provide evidence demonstrating that climate change, especially anthropogenic climate change, that is climate change caused by humans, is a real phenomenon. Thus, stay your fingers before rushing down to the comment section to leave us a lengthy note on how combating climate change will impact taxation. That's not the point of this video. Okay, let's get to the data. There are a lot of myths and misconceptions surrounding climate change at least as many as those that surround evolution. It seems prudent then to distinguish climate from weather, as many people confuse these. Climate refers to long-term atmospheric conditions like temperature and precipitation, which are averaged out over several decades, typically 30 years. For example, under the Köppen climate classification system, the climate of a certain area is considered tropical if the average temperature of every month is 18 degrees Celsius, or 64.4 degrees Fahrenheit, or higher. If the average temperature every month is below 10 degrees Celsius, or 50 degrees Fahrenheit, then it's considered a polar climate. Climate can be described on a global scale in terms like global mean surface temperature. We can also describe the Earth's climate state as a greenhouse when there are no continental glaciers present, or an ice house when there are. An ice house Earth is said to experience an ice age, during which the Earth often alternates between relatively cold and warm periods, causing the ice sheets to expand or retract. These are known as glacial and interglacial periods, respectively. Currently, we are living in an interglacial period that began 11,700 years ago that started the Holocene Epoch. This is part of an ice age that began 2.58 million years ago at the start of the Quaternary Period. On the other hand, Weather refers to short-term atmospheric conditions. As an example, you may have a clear sky on one day, and the next it may be snowing, but the planet's average temperature can still be rising from decade to decade. While you might think this is an easy distinction, in 2015, Senator Jim Inhofe famously brought a snowball into the Senate building as his evidence that anthropogenic climate change is a hoax. So, clearly not easy for everyone. But, before we can demonstrate that humans are the primary cause of today's climate change, we must first answer the question, is the Earth's climate actually measurably changing? The relevant statistic here is Earth's mean, or average, temperature. After all, our planet's climate can change locally without drastically affecting the total climate system. For example, some people have pointed to what is known as the Medieval Warm Period, 950-1250 AD, and the Little Ice Age. 1400 to 1700 AD, as supposed evidence that climate change is mostly or entirely environmental, not largely affected by humans. However, as the 2009 paper, Global Signatures and Dynamical Origins of the Little Ice Age and Medieval Climate Anomaly says, quote, The medieval period is found to display warmth that matches or exceeds that of the past decade in some regions, but which falls well below recent levels globally, close quote. So, is the Earth's global temperature changing, and how can we measure it? We discuss different methods of determining paleoclimates in our video, Paleoclimatology, using ice cores, tree rings, and small shelly fossils like foraminifera. Of course, climatologists use even more sources of data than just these, such as coral, sediments, and even archaeological artifacts. Researchers use these together to establish a baseline average temperature against which they can compare the modern temperature. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, chose 1850 to 1900 as the pre-industrial baseline temperature because there are relatively widespread temperature measurements for this time. Based on this time scale, researchers estimate that, between then and 1986 to 2005, Earth's mean temperature has risen between 0.61 degrees Celsius and 0.78 degrees Celsius. 
some researchers have argued that the pre-industrial baseline period should instead be 1720 to 1800 as it appears the 1850s were already slightly warmer. Additionally, volcanic events during the 1720 to 800 period appear to have been low. Ironically, the concern isn't that volcanoes raised the Earth's mean temperature, but that they lowered it. Indeed, volcanoes give off immense amounts of aerosols, solid or liquid particles suspended in the air, and these have a tendency to scatter and absorb sunlight, cooling the planet's surface as a result. This phenomenon is known as the volcanic winter, and there are several documented cases. The 1883 eruption of Krakatoa caused the average summer temperature to drop by 0.4 degrees Celsius. In 1815, the eruption of Tambora is responsible for why 1816 is known as the year without a summer. Of course, volcanoes do indeed spew out CO2 as well, and this has also caused changes to Earth's climate in the geological past. However, that's only when their emissions accumulate over vast time spans during periods of increased volcanic activity and or decreased sequestration of CO2. You've probably seen these memes out there with pictures of an erupting volcano that say this volcano emitted X times more CO2 than humans have since their existence. Don't fall for it, this is nonsense. The 2017 paper estimating changes in global temperature since the pre-industrial period estimates that the Earth's mean temperature has risen more than 0.6 degrees Celsius from the 1720 to 1800 period to 1986 to 2005. Using 0.6 degrees Celsius as a lower bound for the 1986 to 2005 period, 2015 was the first year to be 1 degree Celsius warmer than the pre-industrial period which is estimated to be warmer than at any time since the last 11,000 years. 2016 was even warmer than 2015. So yes, the Earth's mean temperature has risen. Global warming exists. So how do we know that this is caused by human activity? First, we need to cover the basics of thermodynamics. Any object must receive energy for its temperature to stay above absolute zero. Without it, all of its internal heat will eventually be emitted as thermal radiation. If the amount of energy it receives is greater than it emits, it will heat up. When the two are equal, it is in equilibrium and the temperature stays the same. So the average temperature of Earth can only change if there is a difference between the amount of energy that the Earth receives and the amount it emits. This is known as radiative forcing. In the 2005 paper, Earth's Energy Imbalance, Confirmation, and Implications, Hansen et al. determined based on measurements that the Earth was absorbing 0.85 plus or minus 0.15 watts per square meter more energy from the sun than it is emitting into space. But why? Remember that there are two basic factors that determine the temperature of the object, how much energy it receives and how much it emits. Although the Earth produces internal heat from radioactive decay, unless you live near a geothermal vent, this effect is negligible with respect to conditions on the Earth's surface. So for the Earth to warm up, either the amount of energy it receives has to be increasing, or the amount it emits has to be decreasing, or both. Let's first look at the former, the amount of energy the Earth receives, which is also known as insulation. There are several factors that contribute to this. The most obvious of them is the activity of the sun. Insulation is also influenced by Earth's axial tilt, precession, and orbital eccentricity. These change periodically over long time spans. The collective effect of these orbital conditions is what produces the Milankovitch cycles, which is predominantly accepted as the main factor that causes the glacial and interglacial periods. However, the Milankovitch cycles change only significantly over tens to hundreds of thousands of years. This cannot account for the short period of significant warming we have observed in recent time. What about the sun? That's a common gotcha among climate skeptics. The sun's intensity fluctuates over approximately 11 year long cycles. It is true that the average solar intensity was getting higher during the early 20th century, which likely contributed to the warming observed back then. However, this isn't the case for the last 60 years. In fact, between 1987 and 2008, there was a slightly negative trend in solar activity. As the 2008 paper by Mike Lockwood reads, quote, It is shown that the contribution of solar variability to the temperature trend since 1987 is small and downward, 
the best estimate is negative 1.3%, and the two sigma confidence level sets the uncertainty range of negative 0.7 to negative 1.9%, close quote. This would have had a net cooling effect, yet the temperature kept rising. The 1990 paper, Sun and Dust versus Greenhouse Gases, an assessment of their relative roles in global climate change, says, quote, There remains the possibility that small solar changes trigger larger climate forcings. Speculations have included the influence of changes in the flux of ultraviolet light on ozone or the effect of energetic solar particles on atmospheric ionization and thus cloud nucleation but no evidence has been found for a significant impact of these mechanisms on global surface temperature, close quote. So something else must have been the cause. Now, let's look at the energy the Earth emits, for which there are also multiple factors. These can be divided into two categories, whether it causes the incoming energy to be reflected directly back into space, thereby increasing energy emission, or whether it restricts the emission of energy. The first is known as the albedo effect, Practically everything has some level of reflectiveness, but some things are more reflective than others. Things like bodies of water have relatively low albedo, but that of ice is very high. Forests have low albedo compared to open grass or farmland, and sandy deserts have higher albedo. Particulates in the atmosphere that block incoming energy and scatter it back into space also contribute to the albedo effect, such as clouds and the aforementioned aerosols. A reduction in the Earth's albedo could theoretically cause the Earth to get warmer. However, the reduction of albedo as the result of melting ice only happens when the Earth is already getting warmer to begin with, thereby making it part of a positive feedback loop that amplifies the warming effect of the primary cause. Furthermore, the net albedo effect of the Earth has actually increased because of deforestation and the emission of volcanic and human-produced aerosols. Although the feedback effect from the loss of ice partially explains why temperatures change more drastically near the polar regions, this cannot account for the observed global temperature change as a whole. Now we are left with the factors that restrict the emission of energy from the Earth to space. The name of this process is famously known as the greenhouse effect, although this is a bit of a misnomer since it doesn't work exactly the same as a greenhouse. Greenhouses are kept warm because a physical barrier prevents convection between the warmer air on the inside and the colder air on the outside. The greenhouse effect, on the other hand, doesn't prevent convection. It inhibits thermal radiation from escaping into space. This is caused by certain gases in the atmosphere, which are called greenhouse gases. Known greenhouse gases are water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, CFCs, and HFCs. These gases are transparent to most wavelengths emitted by the sun, which lies mostly in the visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the light energy of the sun passes through the atmosphere until it hits the surface, thereby heating it up. This is why it actually gets colder when you go higher up in elevation. Even though you might be thinking you're closer to the sun, it is the surface of the earth that is mostly being heated up first. The surface, in turn, radiates this heat energy back out as infrared radiation. This is when the greenhouse gases do their thing. While they are transparent to the visible light from the sun, they aren't transparent to this infrared radiation. Thus, they absorb it, which causes them to heat up and emit the thermal radiation again in any random direction. Part of this hits the surface again, thereby heating it up even more. Hence, the surface temperature would be a lot colder without the presence of these greenhouse gases. In fact, if the atmosphere wasn't able to retain heat this way, the average temperature of the Earth would be lower than negative 18 degrees Celsius, or 0 degrees Fahrenheit, compared to its current 15 degrees Celsius, or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. The Earth would literally freeze over, and most life on Earth would cease to exist. Besides retaining heat energy, another important effect of the atmosphere is that it distributes heat energy across the surface. Without any atmosphere at all, the temperature differences would be more extreme, more similar, but not exactly the same, to those of the moon, where it goes from negative 173 degrees Celsius, or negative 279 degrees Fahrenheit, during the night, to 117 degrees Celsius, or 243 degrees Fahrenheit, during the day, at the equator. Yes, space isn't always cold. So the greenhouse effect isn't intrinsically bad. It's very much appreciated. The problem is when you get too much of a good thing, it becomes a bad thing. 
look no further than the planet Venus. Since Venus is permanently shrouded by reflective clouds of sulfuric acid, it has an albedo of about 75%, making it the brightest object in the night sky second to the moon. However, the fraction of the energy from the sun that does reach the surface is pretty much unable to escape due to its dense CO2-rich atmosphere. This causes the surface temperature to be 464 degrees Celsius, or 867 degrees Fahrenheit, which is higher than the maximum temperature on Mercury, despite it being closer to the sun. And it doesn't matter where you are on Venus, day or night, polar equator, its temperature is practically the same. This is what you get from a runaway greenhouse effect. Although the Earth will never reach the same state, even if we tried, Venus is just an obvious example for the reality of the greenhouse effect. So, is an increased greenhouse effect responsible for the observed rise in Earth's average temperature? Well, the relative amount of atmospheric greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, have increased drastically. The water vapor content of the atmosphere has also increased. Climate skeptics often like to point out that water vapor is the dominant contributor to the greenhouse effect. However, we are talking about an increased greenhouse effect, and the atmosphere can only hold more water vapor if it becomes warmer to begin with. Again, water vapor is another example of a positive feedback loop. Molecule from molecule, man-made greenhouse gases such as CFCs and HFCs are the most powerful ones. However, they aren't present in the atmosphere in very high amounts. So their overall contribution to the increased greenhouse effect isn't very much. This similarly applies to nitrous oxide and methane, although its increase in the atmosphere is also due to human activity and their combined impact cannot be ignored. Not to mention that methane from thawing permafrost forms yet again another positive feedback loop. This leaves us with carbon dioxide. Its relative atmospheric concentration has increased more drastically than any other greenhouse gas. The increased forcing expected from its increase accounts for most of the radiative forcing that is observed. Is this due to us? Is the excess CO2 produced by humans? Yes, it definitely is. Factories, power plants, transportation, etc. emit tons of these gases per year into the atmosphere. We can also determine the source of the excess CO2 in the atmosphere by looking at the change in carbon isotope ratios. Plants prefer the lighter C12 isotope over C13. Thus, carbon from plants, and by extension the carbon inside fossil fuels that ultimately come from plants, have a lower C13 to C12 ratio. Therefore, if the CO2 comes from fossil fuels, we should expect this ratio to decrease. And it is. Furthermore, since the combustion of fossil fuels takes up oxygen from the atmosphere, we should also expect that the increase in carbon dioxide corresponds to a decrease in atmospheric oxygen. And again, it is. Our fingerprints are all over it. What sort of effects has this had, besides the warming, of course? Carbon dioxide is absorbed by plants, soils, and oceans, causing ocean acidification, and the results of this warrant their own video. Regardless, it is clear that the Earth is warming and that humans are playing a major role in it. We can actually state that our contribution is likely more than 100% of the observed warming. How can it be over 100% you may ask? Well, remember the increased albedo effect from aerosols and deforestation. This has a net cooling effect. Looking at the increase in greenhouse gases alone, we would actually expect more warming, i.e. over 100% of the observed warming. But this is offset by the cooling effect of these other factors. On a final note, climate skeptics often attack climate models as unreliable. However, a recent paper with the title Evaluating the Performance of Past Climate Model Projections concluded that most of the time they're remarkably good. Even 50-year-old climate models correctly predicted global warming. As the paper reads, quote, We find that climate models published over the past five decades were skillful in predicting subsequent global mean surface temperature changes, with most models examined showing warming consistent with observations, particularly when mismatches between model projected and observationally estimated forcings were taken into account. Close quote. In the same way that biological evolution is accepted by over 99% of researchers in the relevant fields, so too anthropogenic climate change is accepted by over 99% of researchers in the relevant fields. Climate change is happening, and we are playing a major role in it. So, 
Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.